Hey everyone, a quick intro before the intro. I totally forgot to mention in my first recording that there's a sponsor for the video, Magic Spoon. Uh, I was just too excited to talk about the letter from the producer live. So about 30 seconds into me yapping and rambling, it's gonna just kind of do a random cut to the Magic Spoon ad. And then when it comes back, live letter stuff as usual. So thanks to them for sponsoring and thanks to you for understanding. So enjoy the video. Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here. And in this video, I'm gonna be giving you a brief overview of the letter from the producer live number 80 that just took place during the start of the 14 hour broadcast for the 10th anniversary of Final Fantasy 14. What an intro that had to be. It wasn't an overly eventful one. We really didn't know what they were gonna talk about in this live letter because we knew that combat stuff was not going to be in this. We've known that for a while now, both from my previous experiences in pre and Walker expansions and because they told us back in packs. Now, before the video kicks off, though, Magic Spoon is back to sponsor another video. If you haven't heard of them, Magic Spoon is a cereal that brings out the kid in you while feeding the adult in you. High in protein, carb conscious and best of all, delicious. For me, it's tough sometimes wanting to treat myself to something that satiates my intense sugar cravings that I know full well I should resist. I eat Magic Spoon less as a cereal and more as my grazing food of choice, which works perfect considering my busy schedule. And since I can get Magic Spoon as a traditional cereal, just plop some in a bowl, have it at my desk, eat it with my hands, whatever, or I can just grab a delicious treat bar, whichever way, I really feel like I'm treating my soul while properly fueling my body. Now, if you'd like to try Magic Spoon while also supporting the channel, then click the link below to get some today. Build your own custom box of cereal with tons of available flavors, or throw some treat bars in there if you need something on the go. Best of all, use my link and my discount code Mr. Happy to get $5 off of your order. And if you don't like it, Magic Spoon has a 100% happiness guarantee. Let them know and they will refund you, no questions asked. So click the link below or even scan the QR code on the screen and use code Mr. Happy to get $5 off or go to magicspoon.com forward slash slash Mr. Happy to save $5 on your order. It even works in Canada and the UK, so you can order from all over. Thanks again to Magic Spoon for sponsoring, and now on with the video. So what was this one going to be about? Well, in PAX, I had kind of forgotten. They mentioned they were going to be doing some in-game graphical comparisons between current Final Fantasy 14 and 7.0, and that was about 80% of the important stuff from the live letter. However, it did start with something a little bit more exciting. It started with the Benchmark trailer. For those of you who don't know, the Benchmark is a PC-only program, so you can't do this on the consoles, that allows you to make a character, save it if you want to use it for when, you know, Dawn Trail itself comes out, going to be important for those of you who want to make Femros. But more importantly, you can, after you make a character, you play through the cutscene. Essentially, the cutscene just plays and it gauges how well your PC actually runs the cutscene, thus determining how well your PC can run the game. This is especially important now because of the graphics update. Those of you not sure if your PC will be good enough will definitely want to run the benchmark. And if you're on console, well, too bad it's not made for that purpose. Anyway, you won't have access to it unless you want to go on the PC that you also have and give it a shot. Uh, that will be available Sunday, April 14th at midnight. So I'm recording this on Friday night at 1148 p.m. So it's honestly about 24 hours from when I'm recording this, you know, 24 hours and 12 minutes. So uh, it'll be very soon. I'm also going to do a breakdown of the benchmark trailer in a separate video because there is one new skill for each of the existing jobs in that trailer. Plus, we get to see a little bit of Picto and Viper. Really, Picto, we just get to see something we've already seen. And Viper, we get to see the LB3. So you know, that's always exciting. But this is going to be a pretty quick overview. Otherwise, there are some details that aren't related to the graphics updates, but some very important stuff in regards to the graphics update. So here, benchmark available Sunday, April 14th at midnight Pacific time. So that's 3 a.m. Eastern and then so on and so forth for the rest of the time zones. They then briefly reminded people pre-orders available, all the collectors related stuff. So here, uh, you know, what's in the physical collectors? What are the digital collectors items? And of course, we get to see Foxclaw dressed as Zodylin or Zodialin or however you want to pronounce it. Heidi Ark. I don't know. Uh, and then they moved on to just graphic showcases pretty much for the rest of the live letter, like the next hour and a half before moving on to one other fairly important topic. So. We got to see a whole bunch of differences. And honestly, it's going to be a little hard for me to describe it, especially because I'm just using these Discord screenshots. Speaking of which, shout out to the Final Fantasy 14 Reddit. I use their uh, unofficial translations for the live stream, and I'm using 
their kind of collection of stuff for the live letter for this video. So thank you to Miyuna. Thank you to Aluna Minori. Both, again, they're always wonderful, and we always use their work for this follow-up video after the live letters are done. So first, they started by showcasing grass. I know, not the most exciting thing. But you can pick apart a few other details. Not only does it look like BMPs and JPEGs on the left versus something a little bit more refined on the right, but they've made a lot of efforts with a lot of small things. And that was probably the most valuable stuff that we learned in this live letter. For example, when you're walking through grass, it now actually pushes aside alongside your character making collision with it. So it's a little bit more realistic to what it would be like to actually walk through grass. And not to mention, it just looks better. You can see the shadows on the rock in the back. The textures are a little bit better on the rock in the back, even though it's further away. Clouds as well. Not much a difference in the clouds, but overall looking much, much nicer. You can also see here the differences in the hair, the more shiny clay-like hair on the left, the shadows underneath the hair on the right with a little bit of the kind of folded textures on the back. Uh, you can kind of see the islands in the background being a little bit more obscure distance wise from from like uh, like dust and fog and stuff like that plus the actual zoom in on the grass which is really the most key detail uh this was when they showed the grass actually moving now one of the most impressive things happened early on for several mounts they're going to be adding a tiny little detail it's not really an important one but it's one of those things you'll grow to appreciate when you you know are just kind of counting your little blessings um a lot of mounts, when they turn, they just kind of do like this, like they just make like very sudden movements. They're now adding sort of like a turn to most of the mounts. So you can kind of see it with the Griffin here. When you go to make um, a turn to the left now, your Griffin will actually kind of tilt. And it's gonna do that with a lot of the more quadrupedal mounts that we have. So um, things that it visually makes sense to have that little bit of tilt with, like, like Ozma's not gonna tilt off to the side or like the bed mounts not gonna tilt when you do that. But stuff like the Griffin to make it look more realistic or, or more like you would actually imagine a creature to fly and a little less just like an outright video game appearance. You also get a little bit of a difference look at, you know, the grass, the monsters, the actual griffin itself. So good to get to see all that. The shadows, of course. Now, the next one, they went over to Tailfeather and Heavensward and showed some of the differences with the details of the stones in the ground. On the left, I don't need, really need to say much. On the right, you can see the rocks protruding with the moss and the weeds in between. Looks really, really nice. The cobblestones here on the main path being a bit more determined. Again, you have the weeds growing in between, a little bit of clipping right here, but nothing too major. Overall looking a great deal better in all of these screenshots. You're probably wondering, is the PS4 going to be okay? Yes, it will. We also got a brief look at the etherite, really hard to point this one out, but the way the light refracts off the crystal is more, well, crystal-esque. I suppose um, you can even see the textures on the ring and stuff like that looking a little bit better. The little mini diamonds and the layers of the uh, of the, the kind of like gold ring that kind of floats around it. So a little hard to see. You can see the grass again here as well. So there's a lot of little details that you can pick apart and enjoy if you really want to like zoom in and get everything really, really close. And they both have the same weather in this case as well. Uh, next, they showed how clothes look when they're dry versus wet. So they went with this over in uh, Rads. Well, not in Rads, in Favner, outside of Favner. And uh, they basically just like wet the clothes to try to show off the detail. I don't think this was a great set to show it off, in all honesty. I was mostly focused on the eyes, the skin, the hair, the lighting. Whereas the kind of sheen that the clothes have, I don't know, maybe it's just because of the type of cloth that it is. It didn't really work super well for me. It just, I just, my eyes couldn't discern the difference well enough. Again, I was more focused on, you know, the, the skin and the eyes and all that stuff. Uh, then they went into the lost city of Amdapur, and the difference became staggering when you looked at both the environment, the clothes, the background. Even these little, like, background pieces are swaying with the wind now. They look more alive and influenced by the elements and the ground, especially just looking at this screenshot here. I mean, I didn't hate the one on the left, but the one on the right, which is 7.0. Oh my goodness. The lighting and improvement is just on a whole nother level. And again, still very much within the bounds of what Final Fantasy 14 is supposed to look like. So it's not going to be a hyper impressive, hyper realistic thing. You know, it's not going to look like a modern gen game by any measure. But what it does look 
is naturally improved and massively improved, especially again in the shadows and the lighting, which you can get a really good idea for in this picture right here. And in this picture right here, this isn't even a new dungeon. Yeah, this is an old dungeon, which actually I had this question live and then they answered it. They've improved and changed the textures of every field from every expansion. And when you're done with your new adventures, please take some time to go back. The thing that is not finished for 7.0 graphically is really just gear. So there's going to be some gear that's lower texture in 7.0 because it hasn't been updated. One set they specifically mention is the 6.0 job armor other than Paladins. Apparently Paladins, because they did that showcase a while back, is already done. Uh, but all the other 6.0 job armors are not going to be updated, for example. So, uh, But I, I thought that the field areas weren't going to be as done. I, like They made it seem like there was going to be a lot more that was not finished in time. So maybe they set the expectations low on purpose. So when they showcased this, it made it look like they had gotten a lot done. I don't know, but it's good to see that, you know, they show basically we've, we saw Kugane Castle from the very first live letter. We've seen um, Elpis. We've seen Ilmeg. Uh, we'll get to see Ilmeg again a little bit later here. Like we've seen every expansion in area from at least one of them. So it's looking nice. Uh, yeah. Then they went to Ilmeg next. They showed the ground stones again. Yeah. Somebody said in my chat, it looks like the left side of the screen didn't finish loading. <laughs> I love that. Someone in my chat said that. So they, they, they got full credit for that. And on the right, yeah, much more full and complete. And we've seen Ilmeg before. So actually, this wasn't that much of a surprise. Again, the flowers looking less like BMPs and JPEGs and more like parts on the ground. They sway and part with the wind and the players walking through and the collision. You get this kind of mysterious fog effect in Ilmeg now to give it more of an air of a little bit of creepiness given what Ilmeg actually is. And kind of our introduction to Ilmeg is that kind of like shrouded creepy area too. So it kind of matches that also. Um, then they just wanted to show some 7.0 stuff. But uh, they said it would be hard to notice. And the big thing here is they added anti-aliasing. So there's no anti-aliasing as an option. There's FXAA, which isn't something that's super good. It's pretty much how the game is now is how they described it. And then they also added and I'm going to need. Oh, wait, did they? OK, yeah. TSCMAA and TSCMAA plus jittering camp. Excuse me. Jittering camera. So the jittering camera one looked the best, but the big thing with anti-aliasing is they pointed out trees in the like in the distance. And if you move the camera, the trees become ultra pixelated in the distance. With the anti-aliasing, it flattens that out and makes it a lot better. And then with the jittering camera, especially if you spin the camera a lot, it looks a lot better. Um, the best option, if you uh, the best option for removing the jittering while moving, if you're playing on PC, I want you to pick the option that you enjoy best. When you're moving the camera fast, some things might lead to dizziness. So I hope this improves. So that so pick whichever is best for you. Uh, so, yeah, and it was also killing insects the entire time that we're getting in a way. Yeah, FXAA is exactly what we have right now. And then there's just off, which I guess would be really like a frame rate saving thing if I had to guess. Uh, so, yeah, looks uh, looks a lot better. More options. Everything's good on that front. Uh, and then they moved over to the soft shadow option, which um, makes it so basically the way that the, the distance between the, the I'll let them explain it because I, I know what I want to say, but it's almost midnight and I'm tired. So as you can see on the tree shadow, the quality is improved in more detail. There are parameters for soft shadow and the higher you get, the softer the shadow looks, which is a far more realistic looking shadow, which is what they were going for. So the closer an object and its shadows are, the more firm the lines are. The leaves are further away, so they naturally blur out a bit more. That should be closer to what you see in real life. That option can be changed on Windows and Mac, but the PS5, it is basically always on. It always has the highest shadow setting on. So that just means, you know, PS5 is good. They barely mention the Xbox at all in this entire thing. They just constantly mention the PS5. Uh, system config, graph set, uh, graphic settings, depending on your platform. The settings and options will vary. They go over that a little bit later. This applies to every shadow in the game. And, you know, he's just a reminder, if you're worried, the benchmark is soon. Now, he did go into a new area in order to show the waves. Now, obviously, I can't show you the waves here because it's just an image. But um, if you're wondering where this new area is, 
we already know this is Heritage Found. Now, it might be an instance or a dungeon inside of Heritage Found. That I don't know. I think it is a dungeon or an instance in Heritage Found, but that's where it is. It's the area where Solution 9 is placed. It's the Thunder Plains, essentially, but this is out in the waters um, on the boundaries of uh, of that. So I'm curious to see if well, you know what dungeon that is. I don't really remember off the top of my head. But yeah, he said if he turns the camera, the devs are going to get really mad at him. So he kept it very, very still on the waves pretty much the entire time. He then went over to another NPC just to showcase that random NPCs in the world, their eyes sometimes twitch a little bit to the left and the right. Oh, there's a new message, by the way. Let me mark that as red real quick. Sorry, Mark. Um, which is a very normal thing, but apparently it's only for random NPCs in the world. It's disabled in cutscenes and uh, G pose and places like that, just because uh, it may create like, it may be seen as an unintentional emotional tick, especially in a cutscene, because it is true that like sometimes eyes moving like really rapidly is used in really tense moments. And if it happens in a cutscene, it may seem like there's a certain expression of emotion. So they, they have it off for that. They said there was really no reason for them to do this. They just wanted to do it because people might notice it and enjoy the world, but that a lot of people probably wouldn't notice it. So they wanted to show us here. Then they took us over to Tural, where he looked around just a little bit. He, he was very afraid of showing things he wasn't supposed to show. And we just got to see a few little nice details of Tural. If you paid close attention in the walkthroughs that we've seen of the other live letters, uh, then it doesn't really look all too different. But there was one thing he did show us near the end. And of course, he's showing off things like the soft shadows, the foliage, the the wood on the side of the house right here, like pointing out a lot of the little details. Uh, then he switched it to night to show all of the lanterns that we have here, all of the individual items to kind of show the density of things that they can now do with the graphics update and how things look with the lighting and the lamps and, and how much more alive it feels when you look up at the starry sky and all this, all the beautiful stuff, just, just showcasing another facet of it, not just everything in this super proper, you know, daylight setting where everything kind of uh, just has a natural glow to it. The nighttime glow and the way that lights deal with the, the change in the sun's position, the moon's position, the darkness, individual items like this, how they stand out, all very important. Um, then he went to one final location at the very top of Tural. Now we know, because they told us in a previous live letter, that Tural is going to be hosting a jump puzzle. He did confirm that this is the top point of the jump puzzle. And briefly, you can actually see some of the little jumping nubs that are below him. He also pointed out that there's a tower in the distance, this tower where the mouse cursor is right now, uh, that also has a jump puzzle associated with it. So we are getting Kugane 2.0 and 2.5, I suppose. 2.0 with the tower over there, 2.5 with where he's on top of right now. And then he also wanted to show us like barrels, fruits, bags, again, showing us more object density in the game to make things feel more alive and a little bit more like what a marketplace would look like and what it would stock. You get to see some pineapples, bananas. And he very specifically said, no more low poly grapes. But anyway, let's get out of here. Now, they are also doing some other updating. They are adding AMD FSR and NVIDIA DLSS. Now, before we get too excited, FSR is basically kind of like a default setting if you're going to go into this and it if for AMD at least and it is only 1.0 a lot of people upset that it was 1.0 and not FSR 3.0 but all of the preview we just saw I'm fairly certain was using FSR 1.0 and it all looked very good it's just that a lot of people are going to be thinking about how much better it could look if it was FSR 3.0 for DLSS it is 2.0 which most people will agree is a good enough setting could it be a little more updated sure but DL dlss 2.0 has a pretty drastic improvement and they also say that dlss 2.0 is the way they recommend playing the game if you have an nvidia that supports it so uh, all of this should just make for some better graphic settings they do also go over about how you can uh, change the resolution scaling when you're on AMD FSR between 50 and 100%. Lowering the value reduces stress on your device and hiring it allows it to use uh, spatial upscaling on lower resolution images. 
images, you can tell I'm tired, ensuring any loss in resolution is less prominent. There's also dynamic resolution. When enabled, dynamic resolution will automatically adjust the resolution of your screen when the frame rate goes below the desired threshold with AMD FSR and NVIDIA DLSS to offset the resolution loss. We believe both resolution quality and frame rate can be maintained at a higher quality than before. So not super up-to-date options in both of those regards, but options that are better than what we had initially, assuming, of course, they're optimized okay enough. And <laughs> it looked good. It looked good during the live stream. So I'll hope for you. Now, for PS4 and Xbox Series S, they're going to have some things that don't work. For example, the PS4, there won't be as much super sampling. Uh, dynamic resolution and uh, LOD are going to be forcibly enabled. And on the Xbox Series S, just the LOD for shadows will be forcibly enabled. So that's the way they're going to be doing it. Here's where they talk about how some of the gear won't be ready, specifically the thing I said about the Paladin gear before. And then they moved away from the graphics stuff to talk about another very important topic, updates to the blacklist nothing on the friends list but the blacklist i think most of us can agree is probably the more important detail a lot of people deal with harassment and have been asking for better blacklist features for a very very long time we got better blacklist functionality a mute list a term filter looking at you venues estate expulsion which has been a long long time coming and enhanced lodestone privacy so when you blacklist somebody now, not only will you blacklist their character messages, but their character models will be hidden. This has been a massive request for a long time that we just felt maybe there was some engine troubles with them pulling off. Whatever the reason was, they have done that. That will be available starting in 7.0 and it's account wide. Meaning if you blacklist one character on somebody's account, all of their characters will have their messages hidden and their characters hidden. Big, big improvement right out of the gate. So whew, the blacklist will distinguish between characters blacklisted before and after 7.0. Now, keep in mind that only characters blacklisted after 7.0 will be blacklisted uh, account wide. So if you have someone on your blacklist now, that has multiple characters, write that name down, remember it well, and when 7.0 rolls around, delete them and replace them. So that way you can make sure it's account wide. Or if you just notice at some point they're harassing you, then you do it at that point. But I guess I like to be overprepared. Uh, on top of that, they do have to make note, you can still end up in random duties with a blacklisted player. Uh, whether it be duty finder or you joining somebody else's party finder and the blacklisted player being in there. So uh, they will be displayed in such a situation because if they're invisible, then you can't even do certain mechanics. Um, even when their character model is visible, their name will be displayed as unknown above their character in their nameplate and in the party list. On top of that, if they speak, you'll have the option to temporarily see what they're saying. So this allows you to, in some cases, uh, work with the blacklisted person just to do what's, you know, what is best for the party overall um, without actually ruining your blacklist status, without having to take them off of your blacklist. Um, they understand that people wanted just straight up, I can't do duties with them. They said it would make the system a little too complicated on the back end. Uh, their apologies. Now, there's also the mute list, which will just mute, uh, hide the muted characters chat messages account wide. Um, they will otherwise, their names will display as normal. And if they talk in a duty, you'll be given that temporary option again. Now, as for the limits on this, 200 for the blacklist and 200 for the mute list, all of this data is stored in different ways as well. The blacklist is stored server side and the mute list is stored client side. If it's stored client side, that usually means you can back it up as part of the, the in-game cloud system to back up and, and retrieve settings. Um, if not, there is a character folder in your desktop. If you go to my documents, my games, Final Fantasy 14 or Realm Reborn, there should be a bunch of folders. Oh, sorry about that. Labeled CHR. Those are all of your character folders. And uh, I'm turning my phone down so that doesn't happen again. And it should be listed there as well. So if you're someone like me who backs that up, it can be very important. Uh, for console, I'm not sure. Hopefully the backup, the in-game backup works just fine. 
Uh, characters will remain blacklisted across all platforms, but as the character names are saved client side, their names will only display when playing on the device they were registered on. Yeah, it's a little complicated, but I'm sure there'll be some growing pains, but either way, some new options all the same. Term filter applies to say, tell, yell, shout, and emote in all circumstances, including duties. It will not apply to link shells, cross world link shells, party, or free company chat, though. So you can still, if somebody wants to, so let's say you hate getting all these venue shouts when you're in town, right? But somebody in your FC wants to talk about how they hate it too. You'll be able to see your FC mate talking about it essentially because you want their term, it won't get filtered. But I know that's what I'm using it for because there's way too much of that nowadays and I just don't want to see it. Um, that data is also stored client side. Um, estate expulsion will now remove people from the no entry list, even if they are already in the house. That was a problem before you could set someone to no entry, but then they could still technically, if they were already in the house, you had to wait till they left before they couldn't get back in. Um, if they're on the no entry list, they will be unable to enter the estate for 10 days, which doesn't make sense. They should just be permanently removed. I don't understand what's happening there, but it does apply account wide. So if you expel someone, they can't just swap characters and then go in. Nope. They will be completely gone on all their characters. They would have to come on a whole nother account. Uh, now, by default, free company masters and estate owners have access to this. They can set up to four members or housemates that also have access to that function. And when players with expulsion privileges are in the estate, anyone registered to their blacklists will automatically be expelled when attempting to enter the estate grounds. So you can kind of set up like bouncers for venues in a sense funny like i was like i'm tired of the venue shouts but venues venues are fine i'm just tired of the shouts um so a very useful thing for people who hold any sort of social event whether it be a stage reborn they used to do plays and people would sometimes just be jerks and jump on stage they can expel them and they can't get back in now uh or if you're somebody who runs you know a casual dj venue or something like that or a club or whatnot you now have a kind of like an official way to do bouncing activities. So it should be all the, should be good for a lot of people, I guess is the point. And Lodestone just getting better privacy settings. You can hide certain aspects of the account page. Now you can remove yourself from character searches, which uh, is going to be useful for a handful of things, especially prominent for uh, th there's a lot more use of the Lodestone in Japan as more of a social function. So these things are more useful there. But I do see a lot of that on the NA side as well of people who search up people's Lodestones and use that to harass them as well. So this should help those people on top of that. It does. It does act kind of in both ways. The people who are the harass can hide more easily as well but i mean you can't win what are you gonna do right there's always gonna be something that's gonna that's gonna happen uh you can also block players from viewing your lodestone and uh the above settings will also apply to characters added to your in-game blacklist so a little bit of cross functionality between the two and that was pretty much it uh, they did take some time to do some other announcements at this point they did the schedule and then they did a brief uh like a like a survey survey results that they did on like twitter i think uh, like a couple months back so first of all the yokai event is returning we knew this was coming they said they wanted to run it one more time before dawn trail and it should have new rewards they didn't mention the new rewards but they said they would want rewards for sage and reaper so we're assuming those will be there. That's going to be on April 24th and is going to be running for actually quite some time, but we'll get into that in a little bit. They did show one new reward, which is a framer kit that looks pretty nice. I'm really hoping Sage and Reaper rewards are in there as well, since they didn't really talk about it. But all the same, moving on, we have our new launch schedule, our, our Road to Dawn Trail. So 16 crossover event currently ongoing. Yokai Watch collaboration event will return on Wednesday, April 24th. Then the crossover event will end on May 8th while the Yokai Watch event continues all the way until expansion maintenance starts, which we'll get to in a second. Now, the media tour will officially begin on May 15th. The next Moogle Treasure Tove will officially begin on May 14th. And the combat live letter with the job action trailer, all the new actions, whatever Yoshi P can get to in that time will be on May 16th. So that is a loaded week, the very middle of May. Make it rain beginning, Treasure Trove, Media Tour, and the live letter all there and the media tour will last about two weeks from that point on and the make it rain event and media tour will both end on the 30th and 31st respectively 
Going into June, we still have Moogle Treasure Trove ongoing, Yokai Watch event ongoing, but on June 5th, the Dragon Quest 10 collaboration is going to return for just a couple of weeks. I think they just want to run that. Um, I don't know. They didn't make any mention of it being in honor of Akira Toriyama, but I think the community will do that for them, and I think they also know that. Um, it also has not rerun in quite some time, so it's kind of overdue. There will be another letter from the producer live. This will be number 82 on June 14th. That should have the launch trailer and any last minute details about the game's system related changes we don't know about. Then we'll have Dragon Quest X end on June 20th. We'll have the uh, Moogle Treasure Trove end on June 24th. We'll have the Yokai Watch event end on the 26th. And then there will be a 48 hour maintenance from the 26th into the early hours of the 28th before we get to Dawn Trail Early Access. So we have a loaded schedule with a lot of collabs for those of you who are newer, for those of you who may not have been subscribed during the previous ones or just logging in every day no matter what and are looking for something else to do. Then they briefly went over, like I said, some statistics, over 30 million registered accounts, over 240 accolades received worldwide for Final Fantasy 14 out of 313 nominations. There are 88 total etherites in the game, 325 total duties, 159 hours of cutscenes. We have an official number now for the number of what I'm assuming is exclusively main scenario cutscenes. I'm assuming this doesn't even include outside of the MSQ because that that's in line with my experience in terms of just MSQ. So Whew, that's a time. Oh, no, it does include side quests. Would you look at that? I missed that text before. Really? I thought it would be longer then. Eh, maybe what they consider a cutscene is not the same as me. Yeah, I don't know. But 159 hours of cutscenes. There's over, there's 4,917 minutes of music ac across 1,583 different songs. Sokin's working hard. Then they had a bunch of really random statistics. So apparently... If you assume Materia weighs 100 grams per orb, then there's been 16,096 tons, metric tons of Materia melded in the past year, which is equal to the total platinum reserves on all of the Earth. Okay. Um, apparently, if you assume that the cork from a Realm Reborn Red's animation travels 10 meters, that in the last year 46,152 kilometers is the total distance that those corks have traveled collectively okay now this one 54,350,656 liters of potions not including fantasias which means that real number is about five times that if you were to include fantasias now that's assuming that every potion is 100 milliliters then these are the surveys from Twitter that they did a few months back. So what expansion everyone started on? Uh, Realm Reborn, 26%. Heavensward, 13%. Stormblood, 14%. Shadowbringers, 34%. No big surprise there. And Endwalker, 13%. I guess I, as a 1.0 player, don't count for anything. They just threw me into the 26%, obviously. Uh, let's see. It's nice to see the results we built. Shadowbringers had a lot of influence, a lot of influencers playing it. And it was also during uh, COVID time, people couldn't leave their house. Are you all right, cat players? We have another dog in the top 10. Oh, there it is for cat people. Ah, yes. Yeah, so next was favorite mounts. So again, this was a survey. This isn't most obtained. This was just people saying, hey, this is my favorite one. Black Chocobo in 10th, Regalia Type G in 9th, Garland GL2 for 8, which kind of surprised me. Aloha, it's not bedtime yet. Stop. Pod 602 for 7. I forgot that was even in the game. Mega Sheba is six. Amaro for five. Demiosma for four really surprised me, but I appreciate it. Fatter Cat for three. SDS Fenrir for two. And the company choke. I figured the company Chocobo would win. I started to doubt myself and I thought it was going to be Cruise Chaser, but I did say company Chocobo first. That was my prediction. But I also thought it was based on availability, but the customization of the company Chocobo does make it quite, uh, quite popular between the barding, the color, all that stuff. Uh, then we had Minions. 10 was Alpha, 9 the Black Coral, 8 the Shoe Bill, 7 Haw Chiffon, 6 Corgi, 5 Morpho, 4 Midgard's Armor, 3 the Lesser Panda, 2 the Fat Cat, and 1 the Starbird for favorite minion. Then we had favorite home point, which we all knew Limzu was going to win. Honestly, the rest didn't even matter. We all knew Limzu was just going to win this one. Uh, I'm surprised the housing areas are even on there because most of the time people 
own a house, so they don't home point there. So it would mean that people who don't have houses maybe are home pointing there. I don't know. And that's only in uh, cities. They said if it was field areas, Tempest would have actually been first place over Elpis and over Kurthus Central. Kurthus Central actually makes sense. You have to home point a lot there in the MSQ. So it's kind of a nice one to have. Uh, then we had Formidable Foe. Now remember, this isn't like a list that was sent out to like hardcore raiders. This is just casually posted on Twitter. So this isn't most difficult. This isn't based on lore. This isn't based on their actual in-game mechanics. It's literally, it's it's a fan favorite pick. And so Hades wins that one. There's no surprise. I was surprised to see an end singer get second. Warrior of Light being third. I thought for sure he was going to be second, first or second. But then Hydaelyn, Athena, Zodiac, Pandemonium, the, you know, P10, you know, special cells guy. Xenos, which kind of shocked me. Uh, Hephaestos and Nail. Nail just kind of creeping in there in the top 10 as like, you know, the actual raid boss. Um, but yeah, those were one for most formidable foe. And then there was favorite. Uh, these were like word that the, what is Final Fantasy 14 to you? And they did a bunch of different regions. Um, so what we uh, let's see. I think this first one is Japan. Uh, we gathered a German and French version. Those we'll put on the load zone. So this was the Japan version. And it's funny because I think someone pointed out that Soken's name is just on here, which is fair. You know, what is Final Fantasy XIV to you? The music, Soken, you know, I, maybe his name is written in uh, is written in kanji here. But I know that they commented and specifically said that somebody just wrote Soken. It's in the middle, second from the bottom row. Second from the bottom row. I mean, these rows are just all mixed to me. Yeah, I'm blind. I'm blind and I'm tired. So now this one was funny to me because at the bottom, it just says hard, happy for the NAT. <laughs> hard, happy, <laughs> log. <laughs> yeah, these are these are all really nice ones. But, you know, that one at the bottom uh, cracked me up a little bit. And then we got to the QVC, uh, like a $400 like designer plate set. And then we had the custom order. This was, it was like all Japan limited stuff. That's limited to Japan. The custom order photo book sets limited to Japan. Uh, what else was there? There was the Popito chips wave two, which they printed too many of. And now they're buy one, get one free Japan only. There's the statue, which I've seen a lot of people say did not get to them in one piece on social. And then there's the planetarium show Japan only. And then a reminder of the final fantasy 16 DLC and that Final Fantasy 14 is currently hiring for a marketing planner for their MMORPG, uh, their MMORPG team and a community planner for Final Fantasy 14. And that was it. That was live letter number 80, mostly focused on the graphics stuff with a little bit of updates regarding the blacklist. The DLSS stuff was really cool, as well as a bit of statistics and a schedule there near the end. Anyway, it is past midnight. I am so tired. I'm going to get this to you ASAP so I can head to bed. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. Stay tuned for that benchmark skill breakdown because we are going to have a good time with that one. And I'll be, of course, uploading my own benchmark results and my full live letter reaction as well. So thank you, everyone, for watching. I will see you all in the next video. And until then, take care.